Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. This is the third session. And I am, uh, my name is Amy Lay. I'm one of the medical oncologists. Uh, I do primarily breast oncology. I have the pleasure today here to moderate this session with Dr. Abram. This is his third session. You guys all know him. And this is a really hot topic because I get a lot of these questions in my clinic every day. Useful nutrition, nutrients and supplements for cancer survivors. So I'm going to let him go ahead and start, and we'll ask questions afterwards. Thank you. So I'm back again, and uh, <laughs> as you know, I think food is really our best source of nutrients and uh, vitamins, but there are some situations where uh, I think we could uh, uh, use a little bit of help. So integrative oncology, I just want to uh, remind you, uh, I just define as the rational evidence-informed combination of conventional therapy with complementary interventions into an individualized therapeutic regimen that addresses the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. And the American Cancer Society uh, made a comment on supplements uh, back in their uh, 2006 iteration of uh, diet, nutrition, and physical activity, saying that there's strong evidence that a diet rich in vegetables, fruits, and other plant-based foods may reduce the risk of cancer, but there's no evidence at this time that supplements can reduce cancer risk, and some evidence exists that indicates that high-dose supplements can increase cancer risk, which sounds counterintuitive. But I like to say that I'm a follower of Paracelsus. Paracelsus was an alchemist who spanned alchemy and medicine in the Renaissance, who basically said, there's poison in everything. The difference between a remedy and a poison is the dose. So, I mentioned vitamin D already outside when I gave my initial remarks, that from the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting this week, they mentioned that people taking vitamin D for at least three years had better outcomes uh, in pr improved survival compared to those who didn't. So vitamin D is an interesting vitamin because rather than getting it from food, we actually get it from the sunshine. And it's a vitamin that has a hormone-like action in that it controls uh, the metabolism of uh, calcium and phosphorus and hence is important in bones and neuromuscular function. Again, it's the only vitamin that the body manufactures from sunlight, and an increasing percentage of us are now becoming deficient in vitamin D because of our dermatology friends who have us slathering on uh, sunscreen, uh, which are getting a bad name this week because people are saying that we're absorbing toxins into our bloodstream from applying these uh, topical agents, but that's a whole other story. You can see I'm not a big fan of sunscreens, and that's why I have little cancer spots being burnt off my forehead, too. So anyway, but because we're doing that and avoiding sun, we're becoming uh, vitamin D deficient. Uh, we learned all about vitamin D deficiency in elementary school. What do, what do children get who are vitamin D deficient? Rickets. Has anybody ever seen a case of rickets? No, not really. So, but for older people, vitamin D deficient can be associated with osteoporosis, osteopenia. But I think that vitamin D deficiency has a lot of other uh, negative implications. Some people believe that it's related to depression. Some people believe that it's uh, related to impaired immunity. We talk about the flu season as if there's a whole horde of viruses waiting off the coast to come in in November and infect all of us. Well, I think what happens is we become, as a herd, vitamin D deficient and more susceptible uh, to these viruses. And there is the increasing evidence that people with low vitamin D are also at greater risk for a number of cancers, particularly maybe breast, prostate, colon, and pancreas. And this is a, a study looking at vitamin D and mortality in breast cancer showing that people uh, who had uh, the highest levels of vitamin D had decreased mortality compared to people who had the lowest levels, which is supported by the data that came out uh, from Michigan uh, just at ASCO this week. So <clears throat> I said vitamin D comes from the sun, 
uh, food sources are few and far between, and most of them are supplemented with vitamin D, and they're foods that I've already told you I'm not in favor of, like milk is supplemented with vitamin D, and orange juice. Both of those, I find, are a little questionable. These uh, deep cold water fish, which are also rich in omega-3 fatty acids, also tend to have a lot of vitamin D. <clears throat> and then uh, other vegetarian sources of vitamin D are nuts, flaxseed, soy, uh, vegetable oil. Uh, mushrooms, uh, fresh mushrooms, if you put them in the sunshine, they actually create vitamin D2. Vitamin D2 is less potent than vitamin D3, uh, but it's a good vitamin uh, also to have. And interestingly, uh, these uh, vitamin D sources are also rich sources of the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, vitamin D to be, so I ask all my patients, the only blood tests I draw in my integrative oncology practice is a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. Uh, the Institute of Medicine actually lowered the normal range from 30 to 20 because so many Americans are vitamin D deficient. I like patients to have a vitamin D level between 40 and 50 nanograms per ml. Each thousand international units of vitamin D3 will raise you 10. So I aim for 40 to 50. Some people try to get 70 to 80 to 90. Vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium and can deposit it in your coronary arteries or your aorta. So you don't want to have too high a vitamin D level. Vitamin D3 is fat soluble. So it should be taken as a gel bead or a liquid and not as a white powder complex to calcium. Many people try to get a twofer and get a calcium that has vitamin D in it. Vitamin D is not well absorbed as a capsule or tablet, better absorbed as a gel bead or a liquid. So again, vitamin D is also present in the same fish uh, that are rich in the omega-3 fatty acids. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the omega-6 uh, fatty acids are involved in inflammation and platelet aggregation. And when you cut yourself or when you have surgery, you want your platelets to clot, and you want to get red, hot, tender, and uh, swollen, that's the inflammation. The omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory and break up platelet clots. So again, our diet has now become much more prone to being omega-6 heavy as opposed to omega-3 heavy. So uh, our dietary intake of omega-3s has decreased 80% in the last century while omega-6s have increased and a higher ratio of 6 to 3 contributes to greater inflammation. And as I mentioned, inflammation is now regarded to be uh, associated with many di uh, diseases of aging, such as dementia, heart disease, and cancer. So does it really make a difference? This was a study done in men with prostate cancer at UCLA. And they took 48 men who were going to have their prostates removed and they randomized them to two different groups. Now remember, I talked about how hard it was to do randomized controlled trials in nutrition, but this was one that was fairly successful. Uh, one group got a low-fat diet, 15% of calories from fat, and were uh, supplemented with five grams of fish oil a day, whereas the other group got the controlled Western diet, 40% fat with an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 15 to 1 compared to 2 to 1. And all the food was prepared by chefs at UCLA and delivered to the patients for four to six weeks before their surgery. Unfortunately, they chose the level of serum insulite growth factor one as the endpoint uh, of interest in this study. I say unfortunately because no effect was seen on serum insulite growth factor one. Mm -hmm. However, the patients having the low fat, high omega-3 diet at lower omega-6 to omega-3 ratios in both their blood and their prostate glands. And their prostates were smaller, both the benign and the malignant parts, and their uh, uh, aggressiveness of the prostate cancer was decreased in the men on the low-fat uh, omega-3 uh, supplemented diet. And interestingly, when you took blood 
from the men on the experimental diet and put it in a test tube with prostate cancer cells, it inhibited those cells more than the blood from the men eating the standard diet without the omega-3s. So suggesting that, yeah, even if you have cancer, uh, it's uh, taking uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids is a good thing. Another study that was not randomized was in patients with lung cancer. Uh, the smaller study, 16 patients took omega-3s with their chemotherapy and 16 didn't. And the patients who took the omega-3 fatty acids were able to tolerate more cycles of chemo and had uh, not statistically significant but did seem to have longer survival. Again, uh, difficult to do these randomized controlled uh, trials. Uh, turmeric. Now, I mentioned turmeric earlier. <clears throat> the first I ever heard about turmeric was at our conventional American Society for Clinical Oncology conference about 16 years ago. Investigators at Ohio State have a mouse model of colon cancer where the mice are genetically programmed to develop colon cancer. And they gave the mice, uh, one group of mice had a turmeric enriched diet and the other group didn't. And the group that got the turmeric enriched diet not only did not develop colon cancer, but they survived longer than the control group. Turmeric does not get absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. So it gets all the way down to the colon and rectum where it can do local chemo prevention or protection against cancer. If you want turmeric to have a, a systemic effect, many people like it as an anti-inflammatory for joint pains, it needs to be modified in some fashion so that it's more absorbed, or it needs to be taken with a black pepper substance called piperine, which increases the absorption from the gastrointestinal tract about a thousand fold. So turmeric, we first sort of started to hone down on uh, when we realized that India is a huge country but very low rates of dementia and cancer. And so people sort of started looking at turmeric, which is like orange ginger. Uh, it's a spice that's used in curries uh, to give the curry more its, its color rather than much taste. Uh, the taste in a curry comes from the cumin coriander and fenugreek. Uh, and in looking in the test tube at turmeric's activity, uh, all of these anti-cancer activities uh, have been seen. Unfortunately, one of the main investigators of uh, this turmeric anti-cancer activity at MD Anderson was found uh, a few years back to have manipulated his data. And so the question about turmeric's uh, real potency has become a little uh, less clear. I personally, however, take it every day for my joint, uh, my arthritis, and I do take one that had uh, black pepper in it. Uh, I used to. Uh, a naturopath friend of mine said, I would be careful about the piperine, the black pepper, because it increases the absorption of everything else in your stomach a thousand fold as well. So I only take two prescription medicines a day, and they're both aimed at my prostate. And when I started taking my turmeric with black pepper, in three days the heat, redness, swelling, and tenderness in my joint went away, but I woke up every night in the middle of the night with a headache. So I said, oh my god, I have a brain tumor, right? Because I'm an oncologist. <laughs> so it turned out I was increasing the absorption of my alpha blocker, at night, which lowers your blood pressure. So I was getting my blood pressure too low and having a headache from that. Hence, I don't recommend turmeric with black pepper for people who take a lot of prescription medicines, especially by mouth. For that, I would get a different turmeric that's modified to be more absorbed. <clears throat> so again, it appears that turmeric has potential as a preventive agent, probably for colon, maybe for pancreatic, this was a study done by one of my former fellows uh, with pancreatic cancer. Only two of 21 patients showed any uh, activity. It appears to be safe with chemotherapy and may be synergistic, uh, which boosts the potential of some other chemotherapeutic agents. So mushrooms. Uh, I'm a big fan of mushrooms. Earlier today when I did my opening remarks, I talked about 
the Telluride Mushroom Festival, you all thought I was talking about psychedelics probably, <laughs> but they're also becoming quite popular now, as you know. But uh, no, I was talking about medicinal mushrooms. People say, medicinal mushrooms? How can that be? Well, mushrooms, you know, you can eat them and have a psychedelic experience, or you can eat them and die. So obviously they do have biologic activity. Uh, so I think that uh, mushrooms are a very interesting uh, adjunct therapy for patients living with and beyond uh, cancer. Uh, hot water decoctions from certain fungi have long been recognized to have health-promoting effects, particularly in Asia, uh, China, and Japan. Uh, 300 species are felt to have therapeutic potential. We in the West are sort of spooked by fungi. We're fungophobic, I think. And, you know, we associate them with all sorts of weird and evil things. But uh, in looking at uh, uh, epidemiology, uh, it was an interesting observation was that in Japan, uh, people that lived in the prefecture where they uh, farmed enoki mushrooms, those are the thin, white, filamentous ones that are in miso soup, had less rates of cancer than people in surrounding prefectures. And they sort of looked at the mushroom and they found that it has this, uh, some potential uh, active ingredients that are both immune enhancing and may have also some anti-cancer activity. Most mushrooms are actually nonspecific immune stimulants. So the 1,3 beta glucan wall of the mushroom resembles a little bit the same uh, wall of a bacteria. So when we consume a mushroom, our body sometimes thinks we're being invaded by bacteria, and it mounts a nonspecific immune response. And that activity requires uh, intact function of our T lymphocytes. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I think, as I mentioned, that we do need an immune system to help us fight cancer. So I pretty much uh, suggest some mushroom supplement for most of my cancer patients, uh, except those who are now on the immunotherapies. Because immunotherapies are working by stimulating the immune system, and I don't know how medicinal mushrooms and immunotherapies are going to go together. So I tell patients getting the PDL1 inhibitors, the nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab, not to take medicinal mushrooms uh, while you're getting uh, treatment. Uh, the information that we have on mushrooms is derived from both in vitro and in, in test tubes, animals, and human, as well as the epidemiologic observations. And there are different parts of the mushroom that can be studied. Uh, oops. Yeah. So this is the mycelium, which is underground. If you're in the forest and you kick over a piece of wood, you see that white filamentous stuff? That is the so-called mushroom mycelia. And then when that uh, matures, it creates the so-called fruiting body. And then often the mushrooms have spores that they eject and to reproduce themselves. And the mycelia, the fruiting body, and the spores all may have different chemical composition and different properties. So they're really very interesting organisms. You know that they're neither plants nor animals, they're in their own kingdom. And interestingly, they're more closely DNA related to, to animals than plants. So probably for us, the most familiar mushroom is the white button mushroom, or the agaricus bisphorus. Now, one thing that people don't appreciate is that all mushrooms must be cooked. Slicing white button mushrooms and throwing them in a salad is a no, because these mushrooms have a cancer-causing compound in them. So all mushrooms must be cooked. However, uh, these mushrooms, the white buttons, their brown cousins of crimini and their giant cousins of portobello, may have some aromatase inhibitor activity, so good for women with breast cancer. But all mushrooms must be cooked. <coughs> And I mentioned earlier that mushrooms produce vitamin D2 when they're exposed to sunlight or ultraviolet radiation. So uh, this was a study uh, looking at uh, adults uh, taking an extract of dried white button mushrooms, and it seemed that the white buttons were a good source of vitamin D2. 
Another mushroom that I like a lot is uh, shiitake, uh, zhangu uh, in uh, Chinese. Uh, I've been eating a lot of these uh, uh, shiitake mushrooms lately. They're very good, uh, fresh, sautéed. Uh, when they're dried and then get rehydrated, they actually are more concentrated in their uh, beneficial substances. In Japan, uh, an extract of the shiitake mushroom called lentinin is one of the most uh, 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 widely used adjuvant immunotherapies uh, for patients getting cancer. Uh, so I like eating uh, shiitake mushrooms. I don't necessarily uh, recommend taking an extract. Something called AHCC is very popular among my cancer patients as a shiitake mushroom extract. I prefer uh, an extract of the whole mushroom, not just that uh, of eating a shiitake mushroom. Another delicious edible mushroom is maitake, or so-called hen of the woods. And the maitake defraction, which is found in both the mycelia and the fruiting body, is again something that uh, people are taking as an immune enhancer or uh, something that may also decrease the side effects of chemotherapy. Pericium, or lion's mane, is a very beautiful mushroom. Uh, my first exposure to this, I gave a lecture in uh, Taiwan, uh, in Taipei, on uh, integrative oncology. And my host was going to take me to dinner to a steakhouse. And his wife said, he's not going to go to a steakhouse after listening to my lecture. So they took me to a restaurant that was a traditional Chinese medicine restaurant, where every dish was uh, health beneficial. <coughs> and the waiters came out and explained uh, what the health benefit of this dish was. And it ended with pericium, which you can find in the farmer's market in San Francisco. Uh, this mushroom may stimulate brain-derived nerve growth factor, and it's considered a neuroprotective agent, maybe against uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Also seems to be useful in patients who have chemo brain. So I like this mushroom for neuropathy and chemo brain. Uh, it's called pericium or lion's mane, and it is one of the edible mushrooms. Uh, probably the most widely studied of the uh, anti-cancer mushrooms is turkey tail. Uh, Trimedes versicolor, now it used to be called Coriolis versicolor, uh, Yongzhi in Chinese. It's one of these uh, woody polypores, so it grows on bark and it's not edible. So uh, it's uh, two different fractions of it, proteoglycans, one called PSK in Japan and one called PSP in China, again, are widely used adjunctively with chemo and radiation. 25% of the cancer care cost in Japan is for PSK, because all Japanese patients virtually are getting this in conjunction with chemo or radiation. And there are positive randomized control trials in patients with gastrointestinal malignancies especially uh, stomach, and now also colon uh, and breast. Uh, National Cancer Institute Physician Data Query Complementary and Alternative Medicine, that's NCI PDQ CAM website. We now post information about medicinal mushrooms for both healthcare professionals and patients. So if you want to learn more about uh, these mushrooms and their use, uh, whenever I see my patients, I just saw a patient last week who said, my breast oncologist told me I needed to stop taking the mushrooms. I said, why? She said, well, if my liver function tests increase, she's not going to know if it's from the mushrooms or not. I said, well, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. Uh, the chemotherapy is more likely to make your liver function tests increase than the mushrooms. And I sent the oncologist a little message asking her, please, not to tell patients that we share to stop taking things that I've recommended, because I know what's safe and what isn't safe. The mushroom of immortality, or Lingji, Reishi, has, uh, again, uh, a very long history of use in Asia. Many of my patients get this in Chinatown, and they make a tea. I don't know how potent a tea is. Uh, I do prefer capsules or alcohol extracts of these uh, mushrooms. Again, the sugars in the coat enhance uh, immunity. And then there's an acid in this mushroom, ganodermic acid, uh, which seems to inhibit tumor cell growth uh, in the test tube. So again, I'm a big fan of medicinal mushrooms. 
the body doesn't like to see the same mushroom every day. So I recommend that people with cancer take turkey tail and alternate it with some other mushroom blend. Uh, one of my favorites, perhaps, is cordyceps, which is a fungus that uh, parasitizes a caterpillar in the Tibetan highlands, and it's used for vigor and stamina. The Chinese women's relay team in 1980 broke all speed records, and they checked them for doping, and all they found that they were taking was cordyceps sinensis. Uh, this is a mushroom that is oxygenating, and it's good for vitality, including also male vitality, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, my standard recommend, recommended uh, supplements for patients living with and beyond cancer would be vitamin D3, depending on what the 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D level is. I like calcium and magnesium largely because I don't like dairy, and dairy is the best source of calcium, and people over 50 need a little calcium, and people on hormonal manipulation, both men and women, should also be on some calcium to supplement their bones. I like the omega-3s for the reasons that I mentioned. I like my mushrooms and turmeric. And I think chemo is a pretty potent antibiotic that even affects our genome or our, our microbiome uh, in the bowel. So I do think that people who have had chemo probably would benefit from taking a probiotic. I like a refrigerated probiotic that contains lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Again, for people that are on immunotherapies, I say stop your medicinal mushrooms and stop your probiotic. For people that are having surgery, I also ask them to stop their omega-3s and their medicinal mushrooms because those are anti-inflammatory and we want inflammation. People who are having surgery, I say, should take a little calcium and zinc because those help promote wound healing. And then, as mentioned, I got into this whole field when I was challenged to study cannabis as a treatment for the AIDS wasting syndrome. And I think cannabis is a very useful supplement uh, for patients living with and beyond cancer. For example, when we think of symptoms that our cancer patients have, weight loss, cachexia, anorexia, pain, anxiety, depression, <coughs> nausea, and vomiting, I can recommend one intervention, that is cannabis, as opposed to writing prescriptions for five or six different medicines that all might interact with either each other or the chemotherapy that I'm prescribing. So people say, well, gee, cannabis is sort of unspecific. It's a plant that has so many different compounds. How do you know really what patients are getting? So the main psychoactive component is the Delta-9 THC but there are at least a hundred other cannabinoids or similar related compounds present in the plant. Delta-8 THC is similar in potency as an antiemetic to Delta-9. And then I'm sure you've all heard of cannabidiol, which is CBD, which has been catapulted to the top of the most favored cannabinoid list because it's supposedly not psychoactive or it doesn't get you high. It is psychoactive because it's useful for patients in anxiety and sleep. So obviously that's working on the psyche. It's also felt to have analgesic anti-inflammatory and is now licensed and approved as an anti-convulsant uh, for young children with refractory seizure disorders. Uh, I was a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which reviewed 10,000 articles published on cannabis from 1999 to 2016. And our conclusions in the therapeutics chapter was that in adults with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids, that is the licensed and approved Delta-9 THC preparations, were effective anti-nausea treatments. And in adults with chronic pain, patients treated with cannabis or cannabinoids are more likely to experience a clinically significant reduction in their pain. So pain, nausea, anxiety, sleep, depression, uh, the thing that I, I still have the biggest problem with are my patients who come to see me who think that cannabis cures cancer. Where does this come from? Well, in 1975, our National Cancer Institute published an article suggesting that in the test tube, Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 THC, 
and CBD all inhibited Lewis lung adenocarcinoma cells. Since that time, however, this research has gone off of our coast and is mainly done in Spain and Italy. And since that time, there's an increasing body of evidence, again, in test tube and in animals, that cannabis may have some anti-cancer activity. And cannabis is also possibly an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, which are also good things uh, that we want. So I'm a, I'm a fan of cannabis, but I don't think it cures cancer. So oftentimes, here I am with my green tea, and a very common question that I get from patients that I see in integrative oncology is, can I take this? So they bring me a shopping bag full of different supplements, and they're asking, is it okay to take? And the real question that they're asking is, is it going to interfere with the metabolism of my other drugs that I'm taking, or is it going to be an antioxidant oxidant problem because radiation therapy works by creating free radicals of oxygen to knock into our DNA causing damage to kill the tumor. Some chemotherapy works by creating these free radicals of oxygen too. Antioxidants take those free radicals out of circulation so they don't do damage. So that's the issue that patients are asking. Can I take this? So I think it's important to know what you can take and what you can't take during chemotherapy, during radiation therapy, and now increasingly during immunotherapy as well. And so, you know, it's very nice that uh, we have this program here today and that I've had the opportunity uh, to chat with you about both nutrition uh, and supplements. And I think I'd like to close by reminding you all that the role of the physician is to cure sometimes, heal often, and support always. And with that, I'll thank you for your